So on today's podcast, I'm talking with Dr. Abdullah Albayeti. Um, Abdullah is uh, the CEO of Medical Chain, which is a company that's investigating how blockchain could be used uh, to uh, as a platform for electronic healthcare records. And he's also working as a, a GP uh, in the NHS. Abdullah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Zach. Thanks very much for having me. That's absolutely no bother. Um, so you're in this class of people that we talk about as medical entrepreneurs. And I was wondering, uh, is that always what you wanted to be? Or when did you know that you wanted to get involved in that this space? Um, I suppose I've always considered myself a troublemaker. And what I mean by that is when I see something is not right, I normally say it or call it out and not just there to moan for the sake of moaning, which I think is quite a strong characteristic of being a doctor these days is being a bit of a moaner, but it's trying to actually find solutions to those problems. I think ever since a medical student days, I used to always be like the year rep. Um, and then when I was in F1, I really wasn't happy about our on call rotor. When I spoke to the rotor manager, they just said, well, that's the way it's always been. And that sentence always triggers me when somebody says in the public sector, that's the way it's always been, you know, something's wrong about wrong with that. So that really got me into my kind of problem solving. Um, how do I fix this? How do I make this better for myself? How do I make this better for others around me? And I suppose what came from that was second year of my GP training. Um, I developed a website called DischargeSummary.co.uk, and that website was created to act as a template for junior doctors to create standardized, good quality discharge summaries in a kind of tick box exercise. And that spun up really into the idea of medical chain with my uh, co-founder and with other members of the team. And that's where I think I, I first realized, oh, I think I've turned into an entrepreneur, entrepreneur now. It wasn't my initial uh, driving force. It was to fix things. But then I realized with all the efforts I'm putting in here, this is actually a business case. This can actually be lucrative and make my medical career interesting by juggling different aspects of it. So I think I, I fell into it rather than it's something I pursued naturally. Mm. When did you uh, realize that, oh, actually, I've got something here that might make money? And did you start thinking about, oh, how, which people did you start talking to when you realized that? Yeah, so I think I've, I've always tried fixing things, as I said. But what happened was second year GP training in, in Leeds, uh, Leeds General Infirmary in Cardiology, and the quality of the discharge summaries was varied to say the least so you'd have somebody with coming into cardiology with chest pain turns out it was anxiety related or reflux related and the f1 is writing four or five pages to explain this person's anxiety episode or their reflux it's all gibberish nothing makes sense where's the gp meant to look the consultant's not even going to refer back to this piece of paper and it's all been a waste of time, unfortunately. I think I might have written end, a few of those letters, unfortunately. <laughs> Possibly. And, and the thing is, we've been scared into so much medical legal chat that we do that when, we, when we're very junior. We think we've got to cover all the bases. Did I write down what their cat's name was? That was critical information. You know, and of course, that's, that's not <laughs> what you need. But likewise, on the other end of the spectrum, we get into very bad habits, as do registrars and senior doctors. And those discharge summaries, when they were needed you know their help to help out on the weekends or something the quality was dreadful you know somebody's had a triple bypass some aortic valve replacement they're on all sorts of complicated medications that need monitoring the registrar's written three lines no information for the gp and good luck to you taking this patient back into community i've definitely seen those kinds of letters and he's only seen those more you know more surgical than medical it must be said yeah. <laughs> but, but you know we, we operated on them good luck um but essentially, I realized that there needs to be a better system for this. So I had this idea, could we have this template, like how you go on the internet and you look up some kind of well score to check DVTs or PEs? Is it just something you can go on, click on a few boxes, generate a uh, narrative that you can copy and paste into this discharge summary? And it's needed very little effort from you, and it's very standardized. Mm -hmm. So I had the idea clear in my head but I'm purely a doctor. I have no technical skills. I think looking at your YouTube video, Zach, you're, you've got a lot more technical skills than I do. And I thought, okay, I need some help with this. So I went to my brother-in-law called uh, Mo Tayeb, who's a, a serial entrepreneur, very much into tech, created quite a few iPhone applications when the iPhone had just come out. And I said, look, I've got this idea. I need some help building it. How would I go about this? 
and he was very dismissive and he said, I've got no time for you. Um, why don't you go on fiverr.com or, you know, go find one of these GoDaddy websites. Somebody will help you build it instead. Oh, okay. That was That's really interesting. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, you know, it was the first knockback. And I think probably we'll come onto this later on in the podcast. There's a big mind shift between being a medic and being an entrepreneur when it comes to trying, failing and trying again. And the mm -hmm. idea of not letting shame and that feeling of shame creep in when you don't do something right. So thankfully that didn't knock me back. And I went to my wife's brother-in-law called Barra, uh, who worked at Sophos, which is an internet security company in Oxford. And I said, look, Barra, you're, you're a bit technical here. I've already been bounced back by Mo. Uh, do you think you could help me with this? And he said, sure, we'll do some coding on the weekends. I'll teach you some basic things and you can then populate the documents the way that you want to. So we worked on it together. It went quite well. We created the website discharge-summary.co.uk and we created different templates for AF, uh, heart failure, NSTEMI, STEMIs. And then we realized this is actually gaining momentum and popularity. Mm. So it wasn't just being used in Leeds. It was being used in, um, in Lewisham University Hospitals, uh, Queen Elizabeth, Princess Royal. And we realized that we were now getting asked by different departments. Look, could you do a care of the elderly one? There's a necathema one. And the balance we were trying to strike is make it as easy as possible for a junior doctor within 10 or 15 clicks, having generated a document with minimum, you know, freestyle input, free text input, make it good enough that a consultant can depend on it, make it valuable enough so that a non-clinical coder will get out of it what they need. So the patient smokes, the patient walks with a frame, the department gets more money because they had that patient as an inpatient. This generated a bit of buzz. And this is, I suppose, the switch where it was from a free idea to the entrepreneurial side because I got approached by a pharmaceutical company that said, we've seen your discharge summaries. We think they're great. And we want to essentially invest in this idea so you can create this for all these other conditions that we have medications for. So I went to Barra and I said, look, I've had this conversation in the hospital with one of the drug reps who essentially escalated and escalated it to their regional manager and eventually to the pharmaceutical company itself. What do you think? And he said, look, I'm the technical guy. You're the doctor. Neither of us are business minded. Why don't we go back to Mo, who was business minded? So we went back to Mo and I said, do you remember that idea I asked you to get involved in about six months ago? Uh, <laughs> it's actually taken off now and I, I pursued it. It's all right. Very good. Well done. You know, excellent that you, you did that. So what are you thinking of selling it for? And I said, look, me and uh, Barra, or we call him Barry. I said, me and Barry, you know, we're not, we're not greedy, but we've put a lot of effort, a lot of weekends, a lot of nights into this and maintenance and whatnot. So we're thinking 5,000 pounds. And then Mo just started laughing at us and just said, you're, you're a couple of idiots, you know, like that's how much they spend on Domino pizzas for medical students. You know, like, what are you talking about? Is this actually what you want to do? So then it led to a much more serious and in-depth conversation mm. with Mo about the problems we have in healthcare. And if I had infinite resource and skill set in the team, I would build something where the patients could be the center of their records carrying that information as a conduit from one appointment to the other. Because mm -hmm. I think that is a massive issue internationally across all healthcare systems, even the NHS, as great as it is, we have patients turning up to A&E that say, do you know what I'm allergic to? I was like, I have no idea. Well, mm -hmm. that doctor last week in Edinburgh, when I was there on holiday, told me I should never take this again. I have no idea. I'm sorry. Can't you see my NHS number? That's not how it works. So I want to solve this kind of issue where there are silos of electronic health record records across the country for patients, and they should all come under one umbrella where the patient mm. is carrying that information with them from appointment to appointment. It's, so it came it's such a massive, idea. massive problem, isn't it? A huge problem. And, you know, to show you the kind of naivety, you know, the idea that we are going to solve this, we're going to fix this kind of problem. Mm. Um, but I think that's what you need. You need that kind of level of, of hunger and you need to start with a problem, which I, I mentor quite a few um, entrepreneurs uh, as well. And I always tell them, you must start with a problem first. Don't build something, then try to hard fix it onto something. So, oh, I think that will solve that. That's not how it works. Come up with a problem first, identify why it's a problem, how you're going to solve it. And then is that even a good business model? You know, will that even make you money? You might solve the problem, but it's not going to make you rich. 
and that's, that's fine. That's probably a good point at which to start talking about medical chain because you know we've yeah. identified you know the problem being these electronic health records that don't follow you around. One of these problems that patients really don't understand why that should be a problem. Now, what's interesting about medical chain is that you're using the the, the idea of the blockchain to try and answer that. Now, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how exactly that works. Yeah, so this is something we researched uh, when we were embarking on. So what is the infrastructure we need that is going to generate a system where we know that the electronic health record systems are auditable, uh, the quality is high, they can't be deleted, they can't be corrupted. And the reason I say that is even within our current system, Medical records are electronically lost. It takes weeks for them to be transferred from one GP practice to another GP practice, even though it's all digital. There are lots of uh, scenarios where there's people accessing medical records where they shouldn't, which happened with Sir Alex Ferguson, which Mm. happened with um, uh, that chap off Top Gear when he had one of his car accidents. He actually came into Leeds when he had a car accident. I, I forgot how many tens or hundreds of medical staff and nurses checked out his medical records wanted to look at his broken bones. Now, there's nothing malicious in that. They weren't going to do anything with that, but the people having access to records, they shouldn't. And the way blockchain works is it's a distributed, decentralized, immutable audit trail system. So what that means is compared to a traditional server, for example, there's one server, somebody controls that server and somebody controls all the data going in and out of it. Can that individual server be trusted if it goes down such as in the WannaCry virus where is your backup what if that entity stops serving it well what if somebody enters something wrong or deletes something or corrupts something so we need a system where a patient who I don't trust is going to provide me with information and I need to know the technology behind it means the patient couldn't have deleted corrupted or provided me with any information that's incorrect now if you think about day-to-day practice I work as a GP I have patients coming in with little scraps of piece of paper with misspelt words such as trimethoprin and they go, this is what I'm used to taking. That's fine. And I'll help, you know, Betty, the 80 year old lady when she comes in with that. (laughs) But if she comes in and says, I'm on pregabalin, diazepam, you know, all these other kind of weird and wonderful drugs, you just think, well, what's that for? I'm sorry, I'm going to have to fax your old GP practice to confirm that's what you're on. And we might be able to sort out your pain in the next four weeks. Can you just bear with the pain till then? The Mm. idea of using blockchain is that the patient, when they're carrying their medical records, I can trust the information they're coming with because it's decentralized, which means they're not the only one that owns this record. There's lots of different actors in this system who have access to this data in the sense of being a guardian for this data and making sure that it's up to date. So if Betty tried changing her medical records, all these other actors in the system would need to confirm that what Betty has done is correct, which mm-hmm. if she tried doing something, there's eight, 10, 100 different charities, uh, health organizations, pharmaceutical companies, researchers in this kind of network that says, that's not right. Why is that changed? No one else has agreed with that change. It's also distributed because as I'm explaining there, it's not one entity that controls it. So there's not going to be pharmaceutical companies banding together saying, we want to get access to this record with nobody else noticing. It needs to have the approval of everybody else. And we've seen the way that blockchain has worked in many other industries. So it's worked very well in the financial industry, for example, with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's worked very well in the land registry industry in Switzerland. And there was actually an article just this morning about somebody whose house got sold without his knowledge and yeah. the land registry have told him. I don't know. Did you read the article this morning? I, yeah, I saw that on on the BBC. So this is a, this is a gentleman that he was away on holiday or something, and then yeah. his neighbours alerted him. Is that by the way, there's someone else living in your house? And then he got told uh, when he tried to kick the guy out. He's like, no, I bought it. <laughs> yeah, quite, and, and, quite a story. And the land registry have told him tough because the guy who's bought the house has legally bought the house. He gave the money. It, the land registry has now been signed over, and that person owns the house. And this is something which is actually fixed by technology such as blockchain, because you would have had to have something called a private key, which demonstrates you're the only owner, the original owner of this information that nobody else could sign on your behalf or do something on your behalf. So in a very kind of trying to keep it basic, it's a system that protects data. It's 
future proof for now because it's what we should be doing in every area of databases and should have been done for something such as track and trace, not using an Excel spreadsheet, mm -hmm. which only goes to 16,000 patients, whatever it was, and how many billions they spent on that. And it's something which thankfully has caught the attention of quite a few companies in this space who we're, we're working with. And it's something which I hope will be something which provides the infrastructure so that when patients come to clinics or come for appointments, clinicians can be confident knowing that the data the patients are sharing with them couldn't have been inputted by the data, uh, by the patient, sorry, or corrupted, and that this information has come directly from another clinician or no another clinic, and it's mm -hmm. just the patient who's presenting the data. Mm -hmm. So that leaves me with a, a, just a couple of questions. So if I'm a patient and I want to have my electronic healthcare record on blockchain, is that something I can do? Um, or is this something that's available to individuals or is it only sort of organizations? So I would say it will eventually be available to you. So I suppose talking about where we are at the moment. So we've been in the space now for four and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked extremely hard to get access to EMIS records and system one records. We're just waiting to, to finish that piece off. And essentially, these are the two largest primary care electronic health record systems in the UK. So we should have about 80, more than 80% coverage of the UK's primary care records. Now, this is the same API or it's the same digital connection that a patient would use when they are going to a GP practice and saying, can I have access to my medical records? And then the uh, receptionist will print them a document with something that's got something called linkage keys on it. And the patient can port that data to their NHS app or wherever else that they want. We are approved on that list as well. We've recently removed ourselves because we're working on another piece, which um, is still uh, really under wraps at the moment. But the idea is that you can take your medical records into any of these different apps. So there's one called MyGP, there's an NHS app, you have access to your primary care records. But what you do with it afterwards, that's the bit that we're working on. So I think accessing your medical records for me is boring. You know, I think if you're young, fit and healthy, so what? You're not going to open it up every day and look at it every day and check it every day. Mm -hmm. But the question is, now you have access to your medical records. What potential have you unlocked there for yourself or for the wider health community? And what can you do with that? And that's what we're working on. Yeah. And there's potentially so many applications of that that are coming to my head just now. If you can link all of the primary healthcare records for the whole of England, then, I mean, that's a phenomenal research resource. Yeah, um, of course. And I know it's uh, in, in the Scottish case as well. So um, patients do have a unique identifier, which, um, you know, they can trace through all of the different health boards. They're still having problems linking up all of that information. Um, but, you know, partly they want to do that because of the research applications of being able to do that. Um, is this something, therefore, that governments are interested in as well? I would say yes and no. So governments are very slow. And unfortunately, the, um, the people that are in charge, the decision makers, they don't really have an appetite for change or solving big problems. Their appetite is more for keeping the status quo and making sure they don't rock the boat, which is not the kind of approach you need for healthcare today. We need a disruptive kind of approach. A good example of that is what happened in COVID-19. You know, I've always been a champion for telemedicine, uh, video calling. You know, we have a separate company called My Clinic, um, which is used in over 78 countries around the world, our telemedicine solution. And the battles I've had with primary care, secondary care, CCGs, uh, chief technical officers of hospitals, we don't need this, patients don't want this, clinicians won't know how to use this. All of a sudden COVID-19 happens, the same naysayers are now the champions of telemedicine, I'll tell you how to use it, I'm the expert in it. Because again, you know, as I'm trying to allude to, these people are more concerned about keeping their jobs than mm -hmm. actually thinking ahead and thinking, you know what, we could solve a lot of car parking issues in the hospital if we didn't drag so-and-so in a minibus to transport them in to sit for half an hour to be told something two minutes to go back on another two-hour bus home you know there's so many things it could solve and blockchain i suppose is the same thing so they're not interested in that sense where they are interested in is the kind of buzzword so for example i think if anybody's involved in 
the health tech space, you'll find that the word AI uh, crops yeah. up n- nearly every other sentence. And for me, it's absolute rubbish. Like, you know, what you are trying to do in artificial intelligence or machine learning is very much possible, but without connecting the data, and that's why we need to work on the data first, it's useless. You're not going to be able to run any algorithms if you don't have vast amounts of data. And you saw NHS Digital the other day try to hijack patients' data and say, look, you're all going to be opted in unless you say opt out. It's like, whoa, 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 what kind of you know, negotiation is this? What kind of information is this? You know, what, why are you treating patients and the general public as mugs? You know, we've seen what happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. People have woken up and realized that data in any form is very valuable. And I don't understand why you think you can take people's data without really their consent, give them nothing in return and expect them to be happy about that. Whereas some American company is going to mine all the NHS data, come up with some new fantastic drug or intervention and where's the payback for the patients and all their data that was involved in that system? Mm-hmm. So I'm a, I'm a massive advocate for transparency and keeping you know the, the kind of ethical uh, nature when it comes to data. By all means, if you want to be what we refer to in our company as a data donor, you know there are m- many good Samaritans out there that donate their blood, donate their organs. If you want to donate your data, that's very helpful, very kind of you. Thank you very much. But mm-hmm. people should be aware this is very valuable. You should be the one that owns it and you should be the one who decides what happens to it and who uses it and who's mm. having access to it. The little theme there about uh, the decentralization of he- uh, healthcare records and really empowering the patient to take uh, control of their own data, that's something I definitely want to ask you some more about. But um, what you were saying about governments, they're being slow to respond. I It made me think that there. I hear that story quite a lot these days. And I wonder if there's actually a generation of doctors at the moment who are realizing that if they just stay in their junior doctor job, they can't actually fix some of those problems, Mm. can't get the public sector to implement some of the solutions, even though you can see them, and are actually having to go and start going into the entrepreneurial space in order to be able to generate enough finance to be able to fund, fund the idea. Is that something you're seeing a lot of? And I wonder, you know, is, is government missing a trick there in that, you know, they, if they had fun, if they had funded your idea, if they'd given more mm-hmm. support, you wouldn't now need to be run, running a private company in order to be able to realize some of those ideas. Yeah. So you, so you touch on quite a few points there, Zach, and, and I would say this is a, a huge topic um, because it really goes back to the fundamentals of even medical school. You know, we we do this kind of lip service of leadership, but we do not teach leadership skills in medical schools. We do not teach free, free thinking in medical schools. We teach the shame of failing an exam, the shame of not succeeding. And we become really um, insular in the sense that I'm only going to stay in my comfort zone. I'm not going to challenge myself. I'm going to stay on this conveyor belt. I'm too scared to try and fail. And that's, you know, a really opposite of what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is trying, failing and failing fast. And it's a good thing to fail because you learn very quickly from your mistakes. And I would say that for anybody out there that is trying to think, how can I get support? There is the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur uh, Program, which I'm a mentor on as well. And one of the things I always tell people is that a missed opportunity hurts much more than rejection. So you must try, you must challenge, and you must give yourself the chance of trying to explore avenues you hadn't thought of earlier. And I think that has to start with medical school. And I've had, I've been on panels before where people will say, I don't think that's fair on uh, taxpayers' money. We're funding you to be doctors. We're not funding you to be entrepreneurs. And it's such a closed-minded, short-sighted opinion. You know, even if you want these guys to be doctors, purely doctors, they're going to be your consultant of the future. They're meant to run their department. Mm-hmm. And also be... potentially where some of the ideas fixing the problems are coming from. Of course, you know, this person's going to be your GP partner running the practice for the community. They're going to see the problems, but you haven't even taught them how to look at spreadsheets. You haven't taught them how to seek resources. You haven't taught them easy solutions to their problems. And that's why you find doctors being pulled left, right and center by 
different bodies, be it, be it managers or other kind of entities in the healthcare system. And, and they're, 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 you know, having a laugh at our expense because we're very intelligent as a collective. We're very hardworking as a collective. We're very well organized, but we have this inbuilt fear of, I shouldn't try, I shouldn't question, I shouldn't attempt. And you're missing a huge workforce there that really could solve a lot of problems. Now, it depends what kind of problems you want to solve. And I think, you know, coming on to the last point that you mentioned there, because there's not support early on, the NHS has been said by many to be a graveyard of dreams. So lots of people have fantastic ideas. Not heard that one before. Yeah, it just, you know, people have such brilliant ideas and it's just a war of attrition in the NHS where all the money and all the hours they've spent gets them nowhere until they finally give up. And the success stories out there, unfortunately, are the ones that have gone into the private side, Mm -hmm. now built themselves up to be super valuable and come back to the NHS at very expensive Sell the idea back to the NHS, you know. Yeah, Yeah. completely. And and again, the NHS, unfortunately, it's not an environment which fosters these kind of collaborations. You know, I've heard of terrible stories, unfortunately, where this person so this i'll I'll try to keep the the details very sketchy Mm. so it's not traced back to them but there was an it person who worked in one of the hospitals that i worked at and they realized that the um form to do with cardiothoracic surgery was very confusing and resources were not being used in the local hospitals appropriately and this it person out of their own goodwill created a whole system programmed it implemented it in the local hospitals for free they used it they loved it and when his base hospital found out what he did he got in so much trouble they told him that's our intellectual property you work for us and it's not for you to give this away for free they banned all the hospitals in the area using his program and they said if they if you want to use it you need to pay us now that's at the expense of the patients that's at the expense of the doctors You've crushed this guy's morale. You threatened him with getting sacked and penalized for what he did. And what was his crime? Trying to help his his local hospital, his local local community as an IT person who'd found a problem. Mm -hmm. So these are unfortunately the kind of, this is the kind of environment people are trying to thrive in, in the NHS. And even though I'm part of the NHS Clinical Entrepreneur Programme, you see what Professor Tony Young does and all the other fantastic people part of that programme. I would say it's not universal across the board. There are some hospitals, Mm -hmm. some trusts, some consultants, especially in my experience, you know, I was blessed to have the kind of rotations I did and the consultants I did that supported me in everything I did. But I know that other people that, um, you know, in medical training or surgical training, you know, they they were real Mm -hmm. um, barriers to this person flourishing and finding their potential. Well, I think I think we can hope that uh, the the current trend doesn't continue because otherwise, I think we are going to have a problem with you know if all of the bright sparks with ideas start leaving to go to the private sector and sell things back to the NHS. I think that is a that is a real issue that that you can see when when some of your junior doctor colleagues are are leaving to to go and do that. But I wonder if we can turn now to talk a little bit more about what you're doing with electronic healthcare records, because I think some of the changes that medical chain is is wanting to make are potentially quite profound. Um, yes. This idea that the it's the patient that has control over which doctors see their their medical records. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of thinking what are the potential advantages of that? And one of the very strong arguments that you put is about cyber attacks and this idea that, well, you know, if it's part of the blockchain, it becomes much more difficult to um, to gain access to all of the electronic health records at one time. Whereas if they're just held on one server, well, you know, if someone gets scammed out of the password, well, you know, that's all that they would need in order to be able to gain all access to all of your records forever. And that information doesn't change, does it, in terms of your diagnoses? Yes, I'd agree. So this is a difficult question for the health community or the, or the medical community or the clinical community. You know, if the patient is in charge, if the patient doesn't want me to see their medical records, what do I do there? You know, if the patient's got, you know, so-and-so mental health problems or addiction problems, how do we counteract that? And I would say that 
like with anything, when you're building it, you're trying to build it for general use by the general population. So, for example, when Uber built their system, they weren't thinking of the people that are at the en ends of the spectrum of age where they would struggle to use such a technology. But it would benefit quite a lot of people. And I would say, again, in our society, or in our community, there will be some people that find this very challenging or would use this as a uh, potential friction between them and the clinician. But I would say for anybody who's interacted with a patient, you will realize a lot of it comes down to rapport and a lot of it comes down to trust. And if I ask my patient, do you take drugs? Are you taking cocaine? Now, if the patient trusts me and I've established a good rapport there, they're going to be honest with me because they know I'm trying to help them. Yeah. And the patient doesn't want to tell me, they don't have to tell me. And I don't see what is the problem with the kind of medical record element, because I would engage with a patient and say, look, um, you know, you've got access to your medical records. I can see here on the system that you do. I just need you to grant me access so I can go through your history and whatnot. Now, the patient can say no, or the patient can filter through it and say, look, it's a, it's a dermatology problem. So I don't know why you need to know about my sexual history, my sexually transmitted diseases in the past. I don't want to share that with you. And again, I really think that is the patient's right to decide what they want to share and not share. And it's our job as clinicians to prize that information from patients and say, okay, well, I just want to make you aware that some of these rashes are because of this, or some of these conditions with the liver are because of a sexually transmitted disease. It helped me if I could see that as well. I think if you treat patients with the respect that they are entitled to and deserve, we'll have a lot more fruitful conversations. And I see that in my own um, in the way that I practice in primary care now, my screen, I'd say 50% of the time is turned towards the patient and I'm explaining anatomy to them or explaining basics to them. And I think we have to move away from this paternalistic idea of I'm the doctor, you're the patient. I know things, you don't know anything. This is my plan. You need to go away and do it. That's not the case anymore. Everything is available on Google. Google knows a lot more than I do. And patients have access to the same information that I do as well. The mm -hmm. difference between me and a patient is that I know the right resources and I know where to point the patient in the right direction. And patients really have to be a partner in this journey where I will tell them, you know, have you Googled it? And when they apologize, go, I'm so sorry, I looked it up on the internet. I go, no, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. What did you come up with? I came up with lung cancer. Great. That's going to be so easy for me to explain to you why it's not lung cancer. And I'm glad yeah. you said that, you know. Did you look at this? Yeah, I think it's gout. Brilliant. I agree with you. It is gout. Have you looked at what your options are? And I think if we're going to share this relationship with patients and it's patient-centered care, mm -hmm. another thing we pay a lot of lip service to, but we don't mean, why are we going to be level partners, but we're not going to be level partners with the data we have access to? Mm -hmm. If I can see something such as a blood test or x-ray that's going to reassure the patient, why does the patient not have access to blood tests and x-rays? The amount of times a patient has come to me frustrated that their migraine has not settled. And all I do is literally open up the neurology letter from three months ago and go, so did we try drug B? Did we try drug C? Did we try drug D? Did we try drug E? No. Have you even got this letter? No. Okay, so basically the neurologist explained all of this to you. And if A failed, we were going to go on to B, C, D, and E. And there's a lot of comfort for patients knowing that they can see the same information we can see. Mm -hmm. There's going to be caveats to that. There's going to be some psychiatric issues. There's going to be some abuse issues. There's going to be some pediatric uh, kind of um, paternal or whoever's going to be their guardian issues. That's fine, but it doesn't mean we should chuck the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. It's still something we should try to pursue, empowering patients to have access to their own medical records. It, it does strike me that a lot of the resistance to changing the electronic healthcare record as it's currently done are actually paternalistic when you get down to it. It's that there is a power imbalance and wanting to not change that really is wanting to preserve the power imbalance between patients and doctors. Because legally, the position has been very clear that if you're a patient, you have a right to access your medical information. You own that medical information. Why the infrastructure hasn't kind of caught up with that, I don't know yet. And it sounds like uh, doing this through the blockchain could be a way of actually addressing that balance. And there's something else that's interesting is the potential to monetize access yes. to your electronic healthcare record. Now, I don't know if you saw the Dragon's Den um, pitch with Generate 
um, they were talking about a browser that would be able to sell your data to advertisers if you wanted to, but it would also give you the chance to control it if you didn't want to. This seems like, like a similar kind of idea for the healthcare industry, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say, yeah, so, so I think it's the right way of thinking. So a lot of the beginning of this talk has been about what are you know doctors going to benefit from or patients going to benefit from doctors having access to their records where normally we wouldn't in different settings of primary care secondary care somewhere nationally you were seen or even internationally you know i had my x-ray in spain i can bring it back with me to the uk and have a follow-up x-ray done for example but you need to flip it on its head and say okay so what can the patient get out of this now the patient has access to the medical records what can they do with this well they can interact with pharmaceutical companies and they can say you know, I took my COVID-19 jab, that's in my medical records, and it's certified and stamped, time stamped on the blockchain. And this is my patient reported outcome and my journal running side by side with that clinical data. And you get a fantastic diary showing this is what the clinicians did, this is my experience. This is what the clinician suggested, then this was my experience. And that's hugely valuable data. And when I say valuable, valuable means money. It means there's a cost, there's a price you can say that this actually is worth this to somebody. And I think patients should be encouraged to participate in clinical trials. They should be encouraged to participate in any form of research as we've seen with COVID-19 and how quickly we develop that vaccine. So if they're gonna participate in it, you need to incentivize them. And I don't think it's a dirty word. And unfortunately in the UK, because of this NHS and this you know holier than thou, we can never talk about money and health in the same sentence, mm -hmm. but you, you should financially incentivize people to go above and beyond and share their medical records to get paid for interacting with that system. Now that can also benefit them in other ways. So if you have a health insurer, for example, health insurance has done really badly because the patient will knowingly or unknowingly fill in their health insurance form incorrectly. And when God forbid something bad happens, then the health insurer goes through their medical records then the health insurer uncovers something which hasn't been tidied up by the GP, you know, from a documentation perspective, such as still smoking has hypertension. When it turns out we were investigating for them for hypertension, they were never diagnosed with it. Letting patients share their medical records with a health insurer for transparency and say, this is who I am. You can tell me for me as an individual, quote me what my health insurance is going to be. Don't give me a generic I'm a 30 year old Caucasian who doesn't smoke. This is your price. Give me for me. And if you can interact that with Fitbit devices and wearable technology to show blood pressure, pulse, what's your, what's your weight like, for example, even that insurance, you can start incentivizing patients and saying, look, your health insurance this year was 200 pounds. We agree with you via a smart contract on the blockchain mm -hmm. that if you can demonstrate your weight has come down or your blood pressure has come down, we'll take 50 pounds off your insurance automatically so you already have this system of an insurance checking up on people in gps systems in cars mm -hmm. if you go on compare the market.com or, or money supermarket you will see that there's cheaper car insurance if you agree to have a gps device in your car and if you're transparent with how you drive your car where you're parking your car the insurance company wants to financially reward you for taking less risk now, again, yeah. if you think, well, I don't want to share that data, that's absolutely fine. Don't share your data. Don't have the GPS in your car. But and potentially it's the same thing pay that. the higher insurance premium as well. So it and, becomes a, a trade-off. Yeah. And now, pay I, the higher I, insurance premium. I'd be interested to know about what kind of money people might expect to be able to make by giving a, a, research, a researcher access to their healthcare record. Is this going to be something that's going to be small sums of money or... Uh, is it potentially going to be more than that? I, th I think it's going to be a free market. So I think it's going to be, you know, I'm a patient and I'll look at the medical chain dashboard. So the, the system, we're calling it called My Clinic Connect. And I'd look at the My Clinic Connect and I'm like, right, Cancer Research UK is there. Pfizer are there. AstraZeneca are there. Um, I could share my data with all of them. But to be honest with you, they're offering £100. They're offering £2.50. I think I'm going to go with these guys instead. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to build a better relationship and a better bond that starts off with data, but then goes on to much more lifelong trials, multi-center trials. You know, if you think about how our trials are conducted today, it is a pharmaceutical company that has good links with a university hospital. 
that will mine that data without any patient's knowledge of a particular population in a particular area of the country and say, right, that's based on 10,000 people. This is what we're doing. Why do you not have a system which is nationally or globally where anybody can port their data into the system and you can have much more powerful uh, outcomes occurring from more data going in there on an international scope as well? The cost or the reward, I think, will come out in the wash in time. And I think even from the insurer's perspective, it'll be infinitely cheaper for them to have an interaction one-on-one -on -one with a patient, morally, transparently, and ethically, than trying to pay off a hospital for data which they might not particularly need. And they have to filter out all the rubbish that's come with that hospital data as it is. Whereas it's much more valuable for them and cheaper for them to just pay an individual and have that person on their books for life, if you will, and keep popping in with them now and again for the next drug they're trialing or the next intervention. And the linkage to potential financial payoffs when things go wrong, actually, is something I've not seen before. Like, you know, I'm thinking about the hospitals that, you know, there's an error in the in the healthcare record. Something gets copied and pasted by one consultant. And as a result of that, the wrong decision is made about whether to take a patient to surgery or not. These are cases which do happen and for which the NHS pays lots and lots of money for. Um, so it's very interesting to me that if there is that link and that there's potential to make our medical records more accurate, you know, that sounds like, you know, a good enough reason to do it for me. But I think people will be listening to this and maybe are potentially a little bit concerned about the, the marketization of, of access, even though that there, there could be quite real benefits in terms of your insurance premiums uh, or in terms of generating some extra income for you. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the market economics here. Are there potential some, potentially some drawbacks of this kind of marketization? So it seems to me that a lot of the, the benefits of what you're doing only happen if all of the records are on the same platform. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a risk of competition? You know, what if there's, you know, uh, there's medical chain on one hand, but then there's plat cryptocurrency platform B, which is also doing it. You know, could you see potentially a tiered system and different health outcomes coming from which platform you're a part of? Yeah, I think I think that's a very a very fair uh, thing to to level at this, and I think that happens really wherever you are. So you have a postcode lottery right now of which is your local hospital trust and what kind of care you're going to get. You know, there's already a two tiered system in in the NHS as it is. You know, my GP practice offices offers uh, irrigation of the ear canal for my earwax. Another one doesn't. You know, why am I being penalized for doing this? Whereas I, I would benefit from being there. I suppose the issue with this really is the idea that where is the unfairness coming in? Is it going to lead to poor patient outcomes? Is it going to lead to patients not receiving the financial reward that they potentially could? Mm -hmm. But I think, again, we come back to the idea of a free market. You know, as a patient, you can port your data to wherever you would like to. That's an old rule that patients have access to the medical records, and it's only been further strengthened by GDPR rules. So you have access to your information and you can take it wherever you want to. Mm -hmm. I suppose from a company's perspective, we would say these are the quality researchers we have on our books and these are the levels of payment they're willing to do to interact with your records. If there's a much more bigger organization out there, an Apple, an Amazon, a Google that can offer better connections with better payments, okay, that's fair. It's the patient's choice. You can go mm -hmm. wherever you want to and take it wherever you want to. I think the onus would be on us to obviously again in a free market to say but look at how good our patients outcomes were look at our customer service you're just a number in that system they don't really look after you look how your data has been mined in different ways without you being being aware of it you see that across the board you know and i think yeah. again we need to have these kind of adult conversations take the romantic nostalgic nhs energy out of these conversations because a lot of that comes in and i think it's really unhelpful People have this very romantic idea that the NHS is here to save us all. And, you know, you've got to clap for all those doctors and nurses. They haven't seen the ugly side of the NHS. They haven't seen NHS England. They haven't seen NHS X. They haven't seen NHS Digital. They haven't seen the billions of pounds that have been wasted in those organizations. Porters up to consultants, they're working their socks off. 
There's lots of goodwill in the system that's keeping it running. You're not seeing how much waste is going on the other side. Mm -hmm. And the same people that are peddling and promoting this idea of, you know, God bless the NHS and God save the NHS. They don't realize you're keeping these kind of cronyisms in their jobs where they, where they are causing so much damage and not actually letting you benefit from what you should be benefiting from. Mm -hmm. So I think always encourage competition, always encourage a free market. You need to get rid of this idea that money is a dirty word. And sure, we need to talk about the economics of it and how is tax going to fund this? And, you know, is anybody going to have to pay anything back with these different um, uh, choices that we make? But I think we've got to have adult conversations about this and not keep this romantic idea that the NHS is getting better. I think you will know as frontline staff, as I will know, it's, the service is getting worse, sadly speaking. That's nothing to do with COVID. That It was getting worse before COVID. You know, GPs were struggling with the volume of patients they were seeing pre-COVID. We're now seeing 20, 30 patients more volume of work post-COVID. And that includes face-to-face. -face. My whole clinic this morning was face-to-face. -face. I only had one phone call and that was for a patient who, who forgot to turn up. So I called them instead. <laughs> so, so, something has to change in our system. And I think what I'm trying to do is trying to put the onus back on the patients. Patients need to look after their own health. Patients yeah. need to be more in tune of what their health problems are and how they can fix their own health problems and take pressure off the system. And the only way you're going to get that is if you empower patients to take ownership of their own health by mm -hmm. having the right information and the right tools to treat themselves and really just to check in with us for advice of, am I going in the right direction? Is this the right thing? You know, mm -hmm. I can give you an example. Think of urinary tract infections. The amount of young women I talk to with urinary tract infections, why or why are they talking to me? You know, I've had it six times in my life. I know it's a urinary tract infection. I've waited a week for this appointment for a two minute call to give me some antibiotics. Why can't, why can't that young woman go to the pharmacy, get her antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. And when it's not worked or she's got new signs or symptoms, which are worse than what she's experienced before. Okay. Mm, now touch yeah. base with me. Cause then the medical be... reviews actually needed. Yeah. Okay. Mm. That makes sense. Completely. So I, I mean, it's, like I say, this conversation is a huge conversation. And when we started mm -hmm. this company four and a half years ago, we didn't realize the kind of logistical challenges or bureaucracy we'd be running into to try to develop something, which I think is, I, I genuinely think this is going to be the future of healthcare. Maybe not in the next five years, but certainly in the next 10 to 20 years, you will see patients coming to appointments, bringing their medical records with them digitally to those appointments. You will not be depending on the clinician logging in, going on some Mm -hmm. software that's running on an old system and say, look, this is all I can see. Uh, and we'll laugh about how we used to do it. The way we used to laugh about using pay phones and calling our mums and saying, right, I'll be home in four hours. And that, you know, you're in communication silence for four hours till you turn up in the middle of the night or not. Now yeah. we've got mobile phones. We think, how did we ever used to be like that before? Yeah. And, uh, and it's frustrating for patients as well. Cause you know, I know that in the hospital where I uh, do the ward rounds, sometimes the, the computers just take so long to do what you want. So the ward round is, you know, five minutes of the patient watching you look at a screen rather than actually interacting with them. But it, it just goes to show how uh, th this idea that's behind medical chain is touching on so many different issues, which are live in the healthcare system. It's touching on the technology, uh, the bureaucracy, the the marketization, and especially the fragmentation of any of the NHS, especially in England. There's just one, uh, a couple of other things I want to ask about potential problems with this idea. So the one is about a logistical sort of thing. You know, is this going to make that kind of delay in the patient consultation worse if they've got to give you access? Uh, you know, what if the patient's not tech savvy and then you know they have to be able to to do this operation in order to give you access to the notes or in an emergency i know that you've thought about that because i've, I've uh, sort of read the white paper that medical chains made but i was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about why this wouldn't slow down a consultation and then the second uh, thing that i wanted to ask about is about the cryptocurrency volatility so yeah. I, so, you know, I, basically, you know, is this going to cause logistical problems if Elon Musk decides to say, do you know what, Ethereum isn't really where it's at, and then the, the, the market completely crashes? Yeah, so I suppose uh, for the benefits of the listeners, there, there are two things blockchain related to the company. So one is the 
infrastructure we're talking about so that the data can be recorded, stored and accessed in a certain way using blockchain. And the other element is the cryptocurrency, which we created hand in hand with our technology, which we call med tokens or MTN. So this is the same as Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin. You can buy MTN online, you can trade in it and you can sell in it. And by creating this cryptocurrency, we were able to fund our company and raise $24 million at the time. The starting point of where we were four and a half years ago, there was a big buzz for cryptocurrencies and a real momentum thinking that this is going to come into mainstream. Again, as throughout this whole podcast, you can see there's learnings and naivety yeah. and being too, too, too ahead of the, the curve, if you will. And the whole price of med tokens, as well as cryptocurrencies, really crashed. And now they're in a state of recovering. But through this process, you realize the volatility. You can't really depend on the price of these tokens at the moment. And that's something which we really thought long and hard about. How can we future-proof access to medical records, right? We use blockchain. How are we going to provide a payment structure which is going to be international and fast? So, for example, the end premise of medical chain is that there is a... We now have access to all electronic health record systems in the world. There's a Chinese patient who's got a knee problem who wants to speak to an orthopedic surgeon in California who's the world expert, for example. How is the Chinese patient going to share their medical records with the doctor in California? Well, the doctor can send a request to that patient's email address, and it's just a, an approve or deny access. The Chinese patient can paste in the doctor's email address or their unique code and approve access to that individual and can filter what they're happy to approve to that, be that on a um, one-off basis, time limited for a week or forever. So the idea is once you've had this consultation, if you don't want that person to have access to it anymore, you can re re remove that person's access. We even thought about doing it in a kind of face-to-face -face setting. So you could have a QR code on the front of your phone and somebody can just scan that. I've spent a lot of time in China. And I think if anybody spent a lot of time in China, they'll know that they heavily depend on a system called WeChat, which is the equivalent of WhatsApp the Chinese population are all using QR codes for everything, buying, selling, healthcare, getting appointments, scan my QR code. So as a general population, I think people do figure it out. There will be fringes of the community where maybe older people will depend on their children or they'll depend on the receptionist to talk them through it and go through the more traditional uh, ideas. But you'll see with our current pl products, which are MyClinic for Telemedicine and MyClinic Connect, we've not reintroduced med tokens yet because that kind of international consultation hasn't occurred. You know, we're still in the baby steps. Yeah. And the best way I describe this, I think I've described it in other podcasts or other talks I've given is, it's the equivalent of somebody trying to do a PhD. When you have this idea, you have this grain of sand and you go, right, that's going to be my PhD. Then you realize to deliver that PhD, that infrastructure doesn't exist. Okay, that's going to be my PhD actually that doesn't exist. Okay, fine. That's what I'm going to research. And you go back and back and back and back and back until you realize we don't even have access to medical records, let alone building a blockchain system, let alone introducing a cryptocurrency international market so that when the Chinese patient wants to pay the American doctor, they pay them in a very cheap, transparent, quick uh, currency online, rather than sending funds through a bank, which takes six days, get several charges as it's converted from one currency to another currency format. So that was the idea of what we did there. And when you talk about emergencies, we also had the idea of a bracelet where you could give permission to certain uh, health professionals who could access that data on the patient's emergency bracelet. But this kind of stuff was really prototype thinking 20 years ahead. We haven't even got the basics of the infrastructure there. We've come a long way. So we're approved on the NHS digital frameworks for uh, our different products. We're approved on government websites as well in the UK to use our products. But I would say, you know, introducing cryptocurrency into the use of our product, that's still going to take some time whilst we're still making sure that the basic logistics of having access and sharing your data is still working and trying to port that to pharmaceutical companies is around the corner as well. Well, I'm feeling very, very energized talking to you because you're saying about how you see things developing in 20 years. And I'm thinking, yes, we need to get a move on and do something <laughs> about it now because, you know, and we need to get our population able to, to engage with some of these te technological advances so that we don't fall behind other countries. 
I want to ask you a little bit about what you see as the the vision sort of going forward. I mean, where is Medical Chain at now? I get the sense that it's still sort of in the early stages of working with local partners, local GP practices, local trusts. What what are the next steps and how do you see this evolving? Yeah, so it's it's a very it's a it's very hard um leading a company such as Medical Chain because you are trying to disrupt an area which is static and the decision makers are technophobic and using terms such as blockchain or cryptocurrency would scare the living daylights out of them. So what I've realized is you really have to take things slowly. Don't talk about the big picture ideas because you're just going to freak them out. But I, I really think where I would love medical chain to be, and again, it doesn't have to be medical chain. I'd be very happy if another company did this or somebody else succeeded in this space. But I always compare it to Google browsers. When we open our computers or laptops or on our mobile phones, our landing page is the Google browser. And I'd like to think as all clinicians around the world, the landing page would be the medical chain landing page where that's how you're gonna start your consultation. You go on the internet, land on that page, sign in as the clinician. You can see all the patient's records that you have access to, and you can ask ahead of time before consulting with that patient for them to give you access, or there, there and then when they're face to face, you scan their mobile phone or their iPad or whatever it may be, and you've got access to their medical records. We're currently in very in-depth talks now with a very large um, healthcare company, which is international. And again, working with a company that big, things move at glacial speed. So we're ready to go. We're very hungry. We're very keen. I'm pestering them nearly every week saying, look, when can we do some kind of joint PR venture? Because I really want to promote that we are associated with a company as big as yours. And that's just taking time. So I hope the future looks bright. And I, I'm glad you're enthusiastic about this, Zach. Um, but I would say there's no point in doing something if you're not going to challenge yourself. And I would say for me, this is a big challenge. Sometimes you feel very smart and energetic. Sometimes you feel, feel very small, very tired. And you think, what is the point of it all? Where is this all going? You know, I'm not seeing huge changes. And I think that's something that as entrepreneurs or as medics, you know, we need to train ourselves to be a bit more patient, trust that you've put something in the oven, let it bake. There's no point in you keep looking through the window and, and waiting to see this, this cake. You know, you need to give it a chance to, to work. And then when your time is needed, you, you know, you do your job as the, as the clinician, you go out, you promote it, you explain to people all the problems you're going to solve and why it's valuable to society. Uh, and that's something which I'm looking forward to, you know, now in the, in the coming years as well. And thankfully, what I can say is we've never, we've never ever touch wood, hit a roadblock where I've thought this is not going to work. You know, this is a bad idea. We need to stop. This is a waste of time or a waste of money. I've never felt like that, thankfully. We've needed to do little pivots here and there. We've needed to feel our way through different systems. Um, we went, for example, on a really big international, uh, um, what would you call it? International uh, showcase or road show where we were going to Japan and Korea and all these places and gathering momentum and gathering interest. And then I realized, look, we're not even doing it at home. We haven't even got the infrastructure at home sorted here. And I work in the NHS. And I'm the chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners in Yorkshire. Like I'm so well connected in this system and, I, and I'm not doing it. So it humbles you and you need to go back to basics. But thankfully, I'm looking forward to seeing how the future turns out. And it's, it's, I, I like hearing you talk about your entrepreneurial sort of things that you've got going on at the moment because you're, you're clearly energized by them. I wonder if that's a good balance to the clinical stuff because um, you know, listeners might not realize, you know, you are still working as a GP in the NHS. Um, but uh, your, your first sort of chosen pathway was through the surgical training. You were going to be an ENT surgeon. And it, it seemed to me that it's just doing both those things at the same time were just not going to be possible because of the way training was set up at that time. Uh, and I'm just wondering if, uh, because less than full time trainings become more of a thing now, would yeah. that have, if that had been more of an opportunity for you that you could have done both, would that have made a difference to you? Um, no, <laughs> because I, when I went through, yeah, so in terms of my medical careers, I, I did F1 and F2 in um, Royal Preston Hospital in Lancashire. And then I got into surgical training in London. And thankfully, I, I competitively 
um, succeeded in getting ENT training schemes for year one and year two of core surgical training, which is quite hard in London. It was quite competitive in my time. I think now you've got F3s and F4s and they're crying out for trainees now. But in my time, it was it was a r- real challenge. Um, I think there are some specialties which don't lend themselves to versatility. And then sometimes, that's, sometimes that is the correct outcome. So for example, if my wife needed some kind of operation on her appendix f- for argument's sake, I would want to know that the person treating my wife has been doing this a thousand times, never took a day off, absolutely loves surgery, fully committed. I don't want the less than full-time trainee turns up now and again, hasn't really done an appendicectomy in about three months because they were on some kind of leave of some kind or some sabbatical. And now they're having a go at my wife. Now we know, and again, we have to be transparent as medics. There is a big difference between being competent on paper and being competent in the job. And we can see that with our colleagues. There are some colleagues you would gladly let them see your parents or your wife or your loved ones. And there's some colleagues you wouldn't want them in the same hospital as your parents, your wife, or your (laughs) colleagues. And I think we need to be honest about that. And I think there is there are some specialties, such as surgical specialties, where it where it is an apprenticeship. You need this person putting in those hours. And I realized that when I was doing ENT surgery, we were doing a thyroidectomy and the consultant nicked one of the arteries. And this is a fantastic learning opportunity of how is the consultant going to get around this problem? I'm going to learn a skill I've never seen before. I should really be paying attention because this could happen to me one day. None of those thoughts went through my head. The only thing that went through my head was, great, I'm going to be late getting home now. I'm going to miss that train. I really wanted to go on the computer and do that kind of work. I really was looking forward to doing this instead. And I realized, frankly speaking, I did not have the right attitude to be a surgeon, to see it through all the way to the end. And I think some people need to have that conversation with themselves. And even, you know, I, I graduated from Imperial College London, and there was a real culture at Imperial that a GP is just a failed surgeon. Mm hmm. And I remember when I switched into surgery, even my dad would say to me, but my son is a surgeon, you know, why are you doing this? And frankly speaking, there was a case of swallowing pride of, okay, fine. I'm going to be a GP. That's the, that's the career for me. And I couldn't have been more wrong. I've absolutely loved GP. I should have probably been a GP from the start and I've benefited from going through surgery and accident and emergency, uh, locuming as a middle grade that has made me a competent GP. Mm. I think my patients like me, even though I'm the locum, they always ask for me and try to book in with me again. That's always a good sign. That's always a good sign that haven't been put off by me. You know, I'm very active in GP. I mentioned there, you know, the chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners. I'm part of the local uh, medical committee for GPs, the union of GPs here in Leeds as well. So I'm a a fully signed up member of being a general practitioner, but I know, uh, and I hope this comes across in this podcast, I'm very transparent when I talk about emotions as well. I know in my mind, this was going to be a downgrade being a GP and I couldn't have been more wrong. And not only has it given me such a great career as being a locum GP that I can pick and choose what days I want to work. For example, I'll give give you a great example. I worked two hours this morning. That was it. 9.30 till 11.30. Thank you very much. You know, and that's considered a day's work for me. Now I can get on with the rest of the things that I want to get on with. I need to go get my wife from the train station later on, for example. I can organize my own time. You could not do that in a surgical career. You could not do that in a medical career and just say, can I just do a couple of hours here because I need to be off. I need to do some other things. I'm kind of a 30-something-year-old adult. I know how to prioritize my time. Can I do this? Can I do that? It just doesn't exist. And you talk about less than full-time training. I've got an anecdote to tell you, for example. When I was coming into ST3 of GP training, so this is your final year of GP training, you're 12 months in a practice. I'd already started medical chain by this point. We'd already raised a few millions of pounds. We had a team of 20 people. We had an office in London and an office in Switzerland. And I was starting ST3 as a full-time trainee and I've got my exams to sit still. And I sat down with my clinical um, supervisor and she's a fantastic lady, Dr. Sarah Harding. Uh, who I'm very close with and we're very good friends. And she's Mrs. NHS. She's all the things I just described to you now, you know, bleeds for the NHS, goes above and beyond everything else. She absolutely loves it. And she was doing my rotor with me and she was saying, right, so you're going to come in these days. That's the on calls. These are the home visits. That's your half day release. That's that. 
I said, okay, cool, Sarah, that's really nice, but um, I can't be here Fridays. And she was like, I don't, I don't understand. Are you a part-time yeah. trainee? I said, no. And she said, so why are you not going to be here Fridays? I said, look, this is my company. Let me show you the website. I travel around the world. I've got all these things I need to do. So either I need the Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, or I need the Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. And she was just like, Abdullah, that won't do. Like, you know, you can't do this. You need to do this. You need to do that, you know, or, or you need to go on a sabbatical. And I told her, look, Sarah, to be honest with you, if you don't give me what I want, I'm quitting GP. It's as easy as that for me. And I'm telling you, I'm not your average GP trainee. I've got a lot of experience behind me. I promise you when I'm here, I'll give you 110%. And credit to her and credit to the other supervisors along my entrepreneurial journey. I don't know how I managed to convince them. Honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> but they all supported me and they said, fine, I trust you and I trust you to deliver. And there was so much pressure on my GP exams because I knew Sarah was just waiting for me to trip up. Sarah was waiting for a complaint. She was waiting for me to fail an exam. She was waiting for me to drop the ball. She was waiting to find out that I hadn't done something so that she could say, you were distracted. You are not fit for purpose. You need to either commit to GP or commit to your company. You can't have both. And I'm very fortunate that I've got a great team within the company that supported me during my training. I had great supervisors such as Sarah along the way that, you know, again, patients really uh, liked me being there. Staff really liked me. I'd come in early. I'd leave late. I'd do more than my fair share. If there were anybody was unwell, unwell, Sarah needed a bit more support. I was there for the team. And even after I graduated as a GP, I'm still there for the team. And it's, it's a quite, real... Quite a good juggling act, I think. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lucky it worked out for me. I don't think it could yeah. be repeated easily. Um, but I, I like to think that even wherever I go as a locum, I'm in, I insist that the staff know me as Abdullah. Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody sends a screenshot message around and says, all the locum could do this, I immediately press reply all and go, it's Abdullah, it's not the locum. You know, I mm-hmm. am the team member here with you and I want you to feel that I'm going to be your team member. And yeah. that's always been my attitude. Wherever I am, I give it my all, but yeah. there's no way I was going to do a sabbatical. There was no way I was going to be a part-time trainee. I just wanted GP training to finish as soon as possible. I'd already yeah. been a doctor for too long, in my opinion, and I just wanted to get on with being an independent doctor and run my company. Well, you've brought a lot of honesty and you know it's been really great to hear your story, Abdullah. Um, one question I always end on, I know you've got to leave in just a few minutes, um, is whether there's a book that you'd recommend that people who have been listening to this and want to find out more about the ideas we've been talking about, you know, where they could go for that. Is there a book, a particular book that you found uh, to be good? Um, to be honest with you, not really. Um, I'm not a big reader. Um, mm-hmm. saying, saying that I've written my own um, telemedicine ebook, written Can You Hear Me Now? Um, mm-hmm. which I, I encourage people to read because they can see where they can use telemedicine we'll anyway. That. We'll take that. You can take that. <laughs> I mean, if, if I was going to give any advice to your listeners, who I, I imagine are going to be medics from the same kind of uh, schools that we've come through, we must improve networking. That's what I did. You know, reach out to people on LinkedIn, turn up to events, try to get the mobile number of Jeff Bezos, whoever it may be. You know, there's no harm in trying ask these people because you'll realize there's so many helpful people. I've had so many mentors and so many people on my journey. I've had Professor Shafi Ahmed give me lots of advice. I've had Jean Neem, who was originally a plastic surgeon and he exited his company, touch surgery for nine figures. There's been so many people that are happy to help you. You just need to reach out to these individuals and network, network, network. So reading books, I think is a great source of material for inspiration. But I think talking to people that are doing it can get you connected with other people that's that's the best advice i could give people oh thanks very much for being on the podcast thank you for having me i really appreciate it if you like the podcast the best way to support it at this stage is to tell your friends about it and share it on social media you can use the hashtag healthy discussions or my twitter handle at monterey zach to tell me your thoughts about this episode In the description, you'll find more about our guests' work and their book recommendations. Thanks to Health Education England North East, Health Education England South West and Medics Academy for supporting this episode. All of us at the Healthcare Leadership Academy are grateful for their support.